Hello and welcome to today's uh, workshop, Free Software Tools for the Classroom. Today we're going to talk about a host of uh, fun, interesting apps that you might find useful for your own teaching and research or for your students. Uh, today I'll be uh, giving this workshop. Unfortunately, my colleague Cameron Wills, who developed this with me, um, had an emergency and will be out today. So I'm going solo on this one. If you do have any questions about any of these apps later on, while we can't provide um, in-depth support for everything that we talk about today, uh, some other units on campus may be able to, or um, we always don't mind talking about uh, best uses and practices with these kinds of things, so we'd be happy to follow up later on. So you can feel free to give us a uh, email later on. Okay, today we've designed the slides to let you know about a number of different apps which are free and have um, interesting little technical uses. So we've badged them here. If there is any app which is free but may have uh, some kind of upgrade mechanism for more advanced features, we have labeled it with the freemium badge here. And if there are mobile apps or a web app or it's available on your desktop or laptop computer, we have badges for those too. We've tried to pick things that are as open and available as possible. Uh, otherwise, we thought that they're just super outstanding, so we wanted to talk about them. And then last but not least here is this open source badge. Uh, one or two of the apps that we're talking about today actually have the code available for you. So if you are very technically inclined, you could inspect that and verify that everything is kosher. And you could even, what's known as forking it, taking a picture or taking a snapshot of it and then creating your own app from it, which is very cool. All right. So first off, I wanted to start with Office 365. Now, I'm kind of curious here, show of hands, who all is familiar with Office 365 in any capacity? Just feel free to raise your little hand here or respond in the text chat. Looks like a number of the people here have used Office 365. Excellent. Okay, good. So uh, most people are familiar with this particular app. Um, Office 365 is a very useful suite of apps that are available to everyone here on campus. Um, once you have logged in at o365.com, you'll notice that you have access to all the standard Microsoft apps like Word, PowerPoint, Excel, but you are actually online and you're using um, internet ready versions of all of these things. You can also get access to your email, calendar, and a whole lot of uh, more advanced ones. Now here I've taken a screenshot of my own um, apps that I have. You may not see all of these yourself. Uh, some are in testing on campus and I'm just helping uh, DOIT kind of work out kinks with some of them. So certain things like Power BI, which has become available recently you may see, but other things like uh, Teams may not be widely available just yet, but we're hoping that uh, once those are working fine, everyone will get access to them. There are a whole bunch of different things that you may be interested in, one of which we're going to talk about next is OneDrive, which kind of acts as the glue behind all these different apps. So Office 365, just something to kind of know about. It is web-based, but there are in fact also mobile and desktop apps. As you'll see from that screen that I was just on here, above the window with all of the different app tiles, is this install office button. So if you do want the full desktop suite of everything, once you've logged in on your desktop or your laptop, you can install them on that computer. Then you have access to all the different features within the Office apps. However, there are as well mobile apps for Android and iOS. So if you've got a uh, Android, actually, or Windows phone, uh, as long as it continues to exist, or an iPhone or iPad or anything like that, there are full versions of all of these available on your devices. So students have uh, no reason not to be able to create a uh, Word document on the train, write their research paper from anywhere, that kind of thing. Uh, it's useful to note that you can install them on up to five different devices. Is it free for Android? Yes, it is. It is absolutely free for all the different platforms. Most of the apps, though, 
Um, you may have to pay to upgrade if you're not part of NIU. If you are a, uh, a faculty member, staff member, or a student here, you get access to the full Office 365 suite. It's just part of the services that the institution provides. One nice thing with Office 365, because OneDrive kind of undergirds everything, you can easily share and collaborate with anyone at NIU. We'll actually see how to look them up within OneDrive, which is very slick. So as I mentioned, um, uses, creating and editing documents from anywhere, uh, sharing working on documents together with people, it's just a fantastic feature. If people are familiar with Google Docs, uh, the Microsoft Office suite now works very similarly. And just so everyone is aware, you can find that at o365.niu.edu to log into our version of it at NIU. And this is a uh, an O, the letter O, not a zero, uh, which is and can be a little confusing the first time you see it, but it stands for Office 365. Okay, so OneDrive, I wanted to talk about that as well. It's a part of the Office 365 suite. And at its most basic, it's a place where you can store files. So you'll see here I have a number of different files and folders that I've added to my OneDrive. I also, though, have a space for files for, um, that have been shared with me. So if Dan or Janet here from Faculty Development uh, want to work on a workshop with me, they can just share their PowerPoint presentation, and I'll be able to go to the, that shared with me area and find those from them. If you're part of any groups at NIU as well, you'll also see that you have access to those group spaces, which would also have their own OneDrive files. So here we have our department files, which is really nice for, again, kind of collaborating on all these things. Once you are in any of the Microsoft Office apps, you'll notice here I'm in the O365 Word online version. I can begin um, creating my document just as I would. It has most of the same controls here at the top. And there's this handy dandy share button. When I click that, this dialog box pops up. And you'll notice I can invite people to share documents with. So here I've looked for Stephanie Richter, um, our assistant director. I just type in her name. I click on uh, her name. And then I decide whether or not she can view or she can also edit. If I want to make sure that um, being from NIU, uh, she always logs in before um, typing on it to make it as secure as possible, I can require her to sign in and then hit the share button and we're off to the races. If you did want to collaborate with someone off campus, like you have a co-author on a research paper from another institution, you can as well get a share link for them, one that doesn't require them to sign into an NIU account, which is also very, very handy. It is, of course, less secure if someone else gets a hold of that. Um, they can edit it as well, so you want to be a little careful. Just let your co-author know about that, um, but that's fine. You know, Most people are adults and can handle a little bit of internet security. Zoe asks, what is the individual capacity? Are you asking for the number of people you can share with? If so, I believe it's a few dozen for what capacity for files. Ah, that is a good question. I want to say it goes up to a gigabyte of files. I'm not exactly sure though. Um, I could definitely look that up later on. I'd be happy to follow up with that later because that is handy to know, especially if you're giving like a multimedia class, if you upload a lot of video files, uh, those can take up a lot of space. Otherwise for standard documents, it's essentially unlimited. Excellent, okay. So as with OneDrive, I was mentioning um, the basic features is just backing up your files. Since they're in the cloud, they're available everywhere you have a device. And there are not only the web-based apps, but mobile apps for all of your phones or tablets or anything like that as well. So you can get access to files everywhere. All of your changes are saved everywhere. It's super convenient. As I mentioned, this is kind of the glue between the different Office apps, allowing you to uh, start a Word document on your desktop, open it up on the phone, share it with a collaborator, and work on the documents at the same time, 
which is highly, highly useful for when you're um, wanting to do some kind of authorship together. You could set aside a time on your calendars with someone else, and then you could both log in and work on the same uh, research paper, presentation, what all else together, which is very, very handy. Alternatives to that, I already mentioned uh, Google Drive and Google Docs. Again, that works very similarly. It doesn't have the plugin to NIU's system, though, so um, you'd have to let each other know what your emails are to be able to share documents. If you're looking for something that uh, that's just a very robust file sharing program, though, I also would highly recommend looking into Dropbox. Uh, I myself have used Dropbox for years. I pay for their premium service to get access to a lot of extra space. I find it's a um, very robust solution. The uh, versioning features of Dropbox have now been integrated into OneDrive, though. So if you save everything there, anytime you make a major update to any file, it saves that new version for you, too, which is very useful if you're looking for going back to an older version in case you made some kind of mistake. And that's also available, again, at 0365.nau.edu, or for any of the mobile apps, you can just go to the app stores on your phone or your tablet and look them up by name there. All right, diving into a few multimedia things. Uh, one common task that we have in our classes may be posting a picture. Maybe you're at a conference and you meet up with uh, an author of the paper that your students read or someone that you're talking about or you're taking picture on location in the field, so to speak. Uh, we often have um, some need to take and touch up pictures. One that I wanted to mention here is Pixlr. It is a very simple web app, although there are now mobile versions available. It looks a lot like Photoshop, except without all of the crazy fancy features. Uh, it's free, it's available on the web. All you do is upload your photo, and then you can do things like, oh, crop it, select pieces out, draw over it, erase, all the kind of standard features we've come to expect from basic and slightly more advanced photo editors. But it can also do things really fancy like layer images on top of them and manipulate each one independently. So it is um, very powerful still. You wouldn't have to necessarily get an extremely advanced suite of tools like the Photoshop suite. So it's still very sophisticated, but it's very accessible. It's simple to use and easy. You can use it right from the web, which is very handy. As long as you have access to a computer, um, you can just take your files, your photos, upload them, and work on them there. Um, there is an optional account you can make if you actually want to save your photos in the cloud. Again, most of us have access to some kind of cloud storage already, so maybe that's not the most necessary. And they've just made uh, mobile apps available. So if you do like the tool on the web, I definitely recommend checking their mobile apps out also. Uh, different uses that you may have, as I mentioned, um, if you're going to a conference, maybe you meet someone that's kind of academe famous out there, uh, top author in the field, or someone that you were talking about uh, in your classes. That, that can also always be really cool to like bring the outside world into your class. Any other uses people have for photos in your class? And so he says that rock star moment. Yes, exactly. You met them. Now you're famous. Now all of your students are two degrees from that famous person. Never wash your hand. Yes, of course. A few alternatives to Pixlr. Um, one that you may want to consider GIMP is an open source alternative. It is available for um, pretty much every operating system out there. Because it's open source, people have taken it and forked the code and built it for all the different systems. It's another um, somewhat advanced, lightweight suite of tools, very useful. If you're looking for alternatives on um, phones or tablets, though, I recommend either Photoshop Express or ViscoCam, V-S-C-O Cam. ViscoCam has become kind of a uh, leading industry standard for mobile photo editing out there. Very handy, uh, very easy to use, and uh, powerful app. If you're interested in Pixlr, that's just at pixlr.com or Pixlr in the app stores. 
Moving on to a different kind of media, audio here. Uh, occasionally we'll have need of creating some kind of audio for our courses, whether or not it's answering a question that our students email us and it just it's a lot easier to kind of answer it just by talking through an issue than by typing out an email or creating a narration for a, a document or a set of slides, anything of that sort. Audacity will serve people really well. Again, these are free software tools, so um, simple, easy to use. They're free out there. You don't have to worry about paying any extra fees or subscription costs unless you want to upgrade sometimes. Uh, it's very, very simple. As you'll see from the interface here, there are only so many buttons. It looks a little complicated, but it's a lot simpler than um, it looks. Since it is free and it's supported by its community of users, it doesn't look the nicest, but it's very uh, useful. All you need to do is just hit the record button, and then you're off to the races, and it's recording everything that you're saying while you're doing so. You'll see this nice little waveform here, form at the uh, bottom. Once you're done, you can just hit stop, or you could hit pause and keep going if you uh, want to take a sip of water, things like that. Once you're done, you can replay everything, start, stop, all that good stuff, and then you can actually edit the audio as well. So here in this screenshot, we have the select tool available. You could select audio and then say, delete everything else. It's not that if you want to cut off uh, the beginning or ending. Or you could uh, slice it up and cut out some of the middle portions. In this particular screenshot, you'll notice that this waveform is also very, very tall. So it's um, someone here was talking perhaps a little bit louder than they meant to. You can also adjust the um, speaker and microphone output in case uh, you record yourself, play back the recording, and realize, ooh, I'm a little loud. Let me go ahead and adjust that. Very, very handy. You can as well import audio from another source. So if you did save it from something else, you could then bring it up in Audacity, make your changes that you want to, and then export it to um, whatever version would best suit you. As I mentioned, it is open source. It's available on PC, Mac, Linux, pretty much anything out there. Easy to record audio and exports to pretty much any format you can think of. We definitely recommend exporting to MP3 because it's been around for so long. Any kind of device can play MP3 files. Um, and now MP3 itself has just been made um, more or less open source as well. Uh, you will have to install just um, a slight extra package with Audacity if you want to record to MP3. I'm hoping because it's been made more or less public domain that it'll become part of the standard install. But for right now, it's very easy to export it to MP3. Um, so I just rec recommend looking into the um, extra plugin for that. And of course, just basic audio editing, something that you won't get easily in uh, most other voice recorders on the desktop without paying a whole lot of money for that kind of thing. Uses, um, audio explanations or tutorials. I mentioned if your students have a question, sometimes it's just the easiest to record yourself video or audio and um, upload that back into your course. Narrations for presentations. I'll uh, talk about another narrated uh, slide possibility in a bit, but this is one way of going about that that's pretty simple. You can step through your different slides, record yourself talking about each of them, giving your standard lecture, and then place those in your course. It's also very good for universal design in this specific instance. So you have your slides that you've uploaded to your course. If you expect your students to review them, uh, you may people you may have people with uh, visual impairments. In that case, narrating the slides is a very good idea, and Audacity serves that purpose very well. Other alternatives, um, other than Audacity, pretty much everyone has a phone these days, and most of them have voice recorder apps. Uh, they usually don't come with as uh, nifty features as Audacity, so you may save down the audio record from them and then upload into Audacity before putting in your course. But uh, certainly don't forget that these are available on pretty much any device everyone has these days. And Audacity is available at uh, the largest open source repository on the net, audacity.sourceforge.net. Any questions about any of the multimedia stuff so far? Or has anyone else used them for anything that they'd like to share?
Again, if people would like to, uh, you can use the text chat to talk, or if, or uh, feel free to talk over the microphones as well. Always nice to hear people. Jackie says, Audacity is a good one. Excellent. Glad to hear that you've enjoyed that. And from Janet, uh, might be correct, Office 365 home, personal, or university subscribers no longer have unlimited storage. Oh, good to know. Effective immediately subscription to those services will only include a terabyte of OneDrive storage. So a terabyte is a lot of space. So you pretty much don't have to worry unless you're doing something like a multimedia production course, in which case that might fill up, though it'll take quite a while. So I was wrong. It's not a gig. It's one terabyte, which is actually very substantial for most people's purposes. Bill Goldenberg says, use Audacity often as a musician. Ah, yes, music production courses. Very, very useful for those. Obviously, it's mostly based around audio. All right. Is, Jackie asks, is one terabyte applied to students? Yes, I believe everyone here on campus does get that amount of space. Though feel free, if anyone finds uh, differently, just as Janet did, feel free to type in the text just to correct me. So as far as narrated slides, Office Mix is a plugin to PowerPoint available from Microsoft, which does exactly that. Here I have the presentation from today. I loaded my slides up in PowerPoint as usual, but there is this new bar up at the top, which lets me, once I'm done creating my presentation, begin recording my narration over these slides. And here's a zoomed in view of this bar here. So once I have gotten everything done, I've maybe made um, a transcript for what I want to talk about, what I want to narrate over the slides. I just click my slide recording button. And again, I'm off to the races and I can record over my slides. Um, I can get through my slides. It still preserves all of the animations, videos, because it's just PowerPoint itself. So whenever I get to one of those slides, I can let it do its thing and then begin talking, uh, pick up from that point. You'll notice there are also a number of other features here, inserting different kinds of things, more video or audio, anything else you may want to add to the presentation itself. Then once you're done, you can play it back to make sure it's exactly as you want. And then you can um, export the video or you could save to the O365 video using OneDrive. If this is for an online class in Blackboard, I would highly recommend exporting to video and then uploading to uh, the, medial, the media library within um, Blackboard. That's an extra multimedia suite that we have here at NIU for streaming video, much like uh, YouTube. It's kind of like YouTube for NIU. That way, everyone gets access to the videos from any device. You don't have to worry about someone not being able to play it back because they don't have a device that can play that particular file type, those kinds of things. So this is very versatile and useful for everyone. Again, it's a simple plugin for PowerPoint. Right now, it is PC only, um, but we have heard they are working on a Mac version. Recording slides, narrating over them, exporting video for use anywhere. Super simple, very handy to use. Uh, you can use it for just standard online lessons, your lectures. One other thing I thought up, um, if you ever can't make a conference presentation, not a bad idea. Talk with the other people on the panel and um, see if they wouldn't mind you just kind of recording your presentation, maybe putting that out on the web for them, um, using the Office 365 video and making it open in public, and then just sending them a link to it that they can play for everyone there. They wouldn't be able to ask you questions, but at least you're still kind of um, presenting if you couldn't otherwise. Cynthia asks, what is the video file output? That's up to you. There are a number of different ones, but we do recommend the MP4 file type. Uh, that's the most universal. If you're here at NIU, again, if you're teaching a class, I recommend the Medial Library, known as Medial, M-E-D-I-A-L. Uploading it there then transcodes it to like half a dozen different file types. So no matter what device people are using to view that content, they'll be able to get a, um, a streaming video source output for them, which is super handy. You're very welcome. Other alternatives to this, uh, if you're looking for more advanced features, 
Adobe Presenter is a very useful one. It um, also allows you to build in quizzes, that kind of thing. Or if you're looking for a very advanced uh, video editing suite on top of that, you could export the video from Office Mix or just originally record it within something known as Camtasia. Uh, that's used by a lot of professionals in the field. We do have access to these here um, in faculty development. We have a small multimedia production um, suite. We have a soundproof room with a few computers for recording these kinds of things. And again, I'd recommend uh, reaching out to one of us. We can uh, work with you, sit down, and um, show you how to use some of these tools, which can be very handy. If you're looking for Office Mix, you can find it at mix.office.com. And it's a simple download and takes like two minutes to install. Because again, it's just a small uh, plug-in to PowerPoint itself. If you're looking for an alternative, though, uh, if you don't want to record just PowerPoint lectures, here at uh, Faculty Development, we often use what's known as Jing. It is a lightweight, free uh, photo and screen capture tool. So once you've installed it, you'll see this cute little sunburst thing here at the top. When you mouse over it, you get options to take a screenshot or to record your desktop. Some people use uh, Jing instead of Office Mix because it's available for both Mac and PC. Uh, once you rec start recording video, you can record any part of your screen. So here I am. I actually cut a small tutorial on using Audacity at one point. So I've booted up Audacity and I began running through how to use some of the different features. Once you're done, you can also upload it to the web or save a copy down. Um, and then you can use that uh, flash file video output place near a course, send it to someone with a link to it in an email, that kind of thing. Uh, again, it's just screen capturing, but again, you could record over your slides using it this way. Pretty simple and easy. Uh, for the free version, you can record up to five minutes, so it does have to be tight and snappy. Uh, Zoe says, Jing, you used it in the past, forgot about it, loved it. Very easy to use. Yes, glad you, glad you really like that. Uh, it is free for output in flash video format only. So again, it's freemium. You can upgrade for more advanced features if you want to uh, save it in different file formats or you want to be able to record um, screen tutorials longer than five minutes. You could pay for those features. Otherwise, for most purposes, you know, five minutes is usually kind of a sweet spot for video anyway. Um, people begin to tune out when it's longer than five to ten minutes, so it's always good to kind of keep things shorter. You can take a longer lecture and cut it up into chunked five-minute sections, perhaps. One thing to note is that there is no caption feature. So once you've output it, you'll probably want to add your transcript as well. Again, good for um, people with different kinds of impairments. And um, if you want to keep everything private, if you've uploaded it to the web, um, you can upload it to screencast.com and keep it semi-private up there. People can search them if you make them public. Otherwise, you can keep them private, and people could only access them with the link. I, uh, we use them here at Faculty Development all the time just to show how to do something within Blackboard. They're very good for just demonstrating new concepts, tools, software, that kind of thing. If you're talking about uh, using a piece of software in your own course, maybe you cut a quick Jing video on how to use that for all of your students, especially if they're online students for an online class and you, they can't come to class and have you show it to them. Uh, this is a really good way to demonstrate that. Alternatives, as Jackie mentioned, yes, Screencast-O-Matic is an um, excellent alternative. Again, just kind of recording short video tutorials online. This one, though, does let you publish to a variety of different formats. So depending on your needs, this may be another good one to look into. And Jing is available at techsmith.com slash Jing. TechSmith also makes a number of other um, advanced multimedia production tools. If you're looking for screencasting on the go, though, we mentioned Jing for desktop screencasting where you record your screen. You can also do the same thing, or at least a similar thing, with Lenzu. This is an app that lets you add a number of different slides, whether it's ones that you create from scratch, you take pictures and upload those into it, or you add a PDF. You can then take those and then record yourself annotating over the top. So here's one example 
from a chemistry course where they're balancing two sides of an equation and figuring out if these chemicals are interacting and how. So that's kind of neat. They went through and they talked about these different interactions, uh, what's happening and why, that sort of thing. Uh, useful for pretty much every class though, and if you're looking to demonstrate something but you're out and you're not, you don't have access to your own computer, can uh, fill that niche very well. If you're familiar with Khan Academy, it's a similar kind of thing. You're recording handwritten narrated tutorials. Lenzu is freemium. It lets you save up to, I believe, five videos. Um, any more than that, and you'll have to pay. But if you're just looking to use it to fill a little niche once or twice, or you don't want to keep the tutorials around forever, uh, it may be just perfect for your, for your purposes. You create your, um, you add your photos, diagrams, PDFs to the slides, write your sketch on top of them. And then, as I mentioned, you can upload to the cloud and then get a link and say, post it into your class. Very easy to use. Um, visually demonstrating problem solving. I also knew of other people who were interested for a sports program, talking about sports plays. You could upload a picture of, say, a line of scrimmage for football and then draw where the different players are going during a specific play. Or uh, for Bill Goldenberg here, composing music, maybe you upload a picture of a musical staff and then talk about some uh, component of musical theory or actually sitting down and composing your own original score. Very useful, very neat. A few alternatives to these, again, uh, mobile alternatives. Educreations is another one that's available on both iOS and Android. Very similar features to Lenzu. Show Me is one that's iOS only. Um, all these companies are competing very, very heavily, so they pretty much all have the exact same features, but feel free to check them out. Maybe one gels with you a little bit better than the others. Lenzu is available at uh, Lenzu Create on the app stores. Once you've uploaded any of your videos, though, you can find them at lenzu.com. Comment from my colleague Dan here. Ah, okay. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Any questions about screencasting or the apps I've mentioned so far? All righty. Let's move on to a couple of alternative presentation tools. Uh, here we're talking about an alternative to PowerPoint itself known as Prezi. Now, I'm kind of curious. Show of hands, how many people have used Prezi before or at least know about it? Zoe, Janet, John, excellent. Okay. A few have and a few haven't. Cool. Prezi is a nifty one where instead of a standard slide deck, you create a number of spaces here. As you can see, there are these like different boxes on this slide in one giant slide or canvas. You then decide how um, your students flow through the presentation. So here you can envision moving from communication to content to assessment and even within them, moving from the main banner or header into sections of the sub canvas as well. It's a more interactive, flowing, visually engaging um, presentation style than PowerPoint is where it pops in one slide at a time. Instead here, you're kind of moving through the canvas. So it can be a little bit more um, interesting and engaging than PowerPoint is in some ways. It takes a little while to kind of get used to its metaphor, but once you do, it's a really nice way of presenting content, especially if you're talking about visual things um, themselves. Again, it's kind of doing away with the slide deck metaphor and instead using a canvas that you draw your audience into. With this particular one, it's very good in representing hierarchical structures too. So we have our main concepts and our sub-concepts, and even those may have sub-content associated with them. So building this up and taking your, um, your audience from top to bottom, left to right, can give a good sense of the overall logical structure of your presentation instead of the standard um, PowerPoint content where we may have headers and then on the slides we may have like bulleted lists or things like that. Um, you create presentations from the web 
And once you do, they do have um, iPad, iPhone apps available for presentation if you'd like to present on the go. Everything is web-based, so you will have to use a browser from the desktop computer. But if you uh, do, and most people do, then it's a very nifty way of making a different kind of presentation. One thing to note is as well, because it's web-based, cloud-based, you can collaborate with people very easily on this, just as you might with PowerPoint through Office 365. One uh, note of caution though, it is good to ask your class or your audience if anyone does have any kind of um, motion sickness. I have known one person before who did, uh, who wasn't able to sit through a Prezi with a lot of different motion. So making sure to kind of keep it to a minimum or not having a whole bunch of swooshes back and forth between things, minimizing too much um, visual movement is a good idea. Prezi is available from Prezi.com, and if you do have an iPhone or iPad and you want to present from with it, present with it on the go, you can look for Prezi in the iTunes App Store. If you're looking for that kind of mobile presentation, though, one thing to note is that there is the PowerPoint mobile app, again, available on all mobile platforms, and it can be used to present your slides, which is really useful. So here's a screenshot I took. Um, from my iPad with just a uh, dummy lecture from Microsoft just to play around with things. Here is my main slide. This is what all my students would see projected from the projector in the classroom. I then also see the next slide and if I had notes available for me, I get to review those here. So I could have my prompts on these. Um, this can be a little bit nicer in some ways than walking around a classroom uh, just with a clicker. While the clicker allows you freedom of movement around the classroom, now I also get access to all of my notes, so I can review those here um, from my lecture if I'm using the notes capability within PowerPoint. So again, using a mobile device to create and present is uh, super useful, and because it is PowerPoint itself, it keeps all of the animations, specialty fonts, graphics, videos, or whatnot that you embedded in your PowerPoint slides which you might not get from other mobile presentation apps, which can also use PowerPoint slides. And again, it keeps slide notes in front of you, which is sometimes extremely useful. Again, presenting on the go, just be able to walk around the class more. Um, highly recommend looking at that if, you're, if you have a more active class that you want to get up and walk around in. It can be very handy. Other alternatives to this, uh, if you use Google Docs heavily, you can import, export, PowerPoints and you can present from them if you have a way of um, casting from your device to the projector. And if you're a user of the Evernote note-taking app, they just added a presentation mode a few months ago. So there is a way of making um, really basic slides and presenting from Evernote too. And again, all you need to do is just look for PowerPoint on the different mobile app stores. All right, so I want to switch, switch things up a little bit. Instead of multimedia and uh, presentation, talk a little bit more about academic day-to-day -day life. Uh, Zotero is a uh, citation index app. It allows you to collect all the citations for different projects and then easily export um, reference lists to Word or other uh, document formats. So here we have, <laughs> Zoe gives a little heart emoji. I see someone uses it and loves it. Yeah, Mendeley, Zotero, these are all really great um, apps to look into. If you do a lot of heavy research, you'll notice here, uh, we were recently working on a research um, paper ourselves at faculty development, and we added our co-authors to it, and then we could begin searching JSTOR, Google Scholar, or whatever else for different citations around the topic for the research paper so we could build our literature review. So here we have an LMS research uh, folder for our group, a number of different um, topics and themes we were looking at, and all the different papers that we'd found on the web. There is a browser plugin for Zotero, so once you find any of these papers, whether it be in one of the main repositories or Google Scholar, you click a button at the top of the browser and it extracts all of the journal article information. 
So it saves all of that for you. And um, you don't have to worry about saving it to a document, having it in the correct format. As long as you've got Zotero here, it strips all of that information out on the web. And then you can tell it, are you using MLA, APA, et cetera, and then export all of these citations out to whatever format you want for whichever document you're using. Super handy, saves a lot of time, and uh, it automatically can back everything up for you so you won't lose any of this. If you lose, if you instead like lost a document, you don't have to worry about that here. Here's another uh, screenshot. You'll notice a citation and timeline tracker so you can see who cited what over time, which can be uh, really fun and useful as well. So features of it, again, basically it's, it compiles your references for research papers, saves references, backs them up to the web for you, and allows you to share them with uh, your group collaborators. So it's not just stuck with you or you having to email out versions of files. Don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just create your Zotero account and it syncs across all your devices and keeps everyone else's um, reference list as well. Web-based. So as long as you've got an access to a browser, uh, you can get access to Zotero. But there is also a more fully featured desktop app if you would like to use that as well. And that is available from Zotero.org. Can we highly recommend this? Uh, one alternative to that would be the Mendeley Citation Tracker. I have some people swear by one or the other. We've um, just standardized on this one here, but all of these are excellent options. Switching things up a little bit again, uh, project management. If you've ever looked for a good way uh, to manage your own projects or an app that you can recommend to your students for their own kind of group work or their own projects, whether personal or um, group stuff, highly recommend Trello. We've been using this one here at faculty development for the past couple of years. And we like that because it has a number of different features um, that work well with the way that we think of working on projects. Here's just one instance where we created a team. Uh, this is just a case out on the web that I found. I didn't want to take a screenshot of some of our own stuff, but here's just uh, one case that you can look at. We created our team. So there's this Travidux team here in this example. And then for this team, we have any number of boards, whether it's one board to track multiple projects or one project per board. On this board, it's much like a bulletin board where we can break things down into different kinds of tasks and then within those have the very discrete tasks themselves assigned to people with checklists, with attached files. There can even be due dates on these kinds of things as you'll notice here on the side. Uh, it's very useful for kind of group work or even just kind of keeping track of your own project workflow. I highly recommend it again, free for all kind of software. So it's um, very nifty. Because it's well, web-based, all of it is saved for you. And there are a ton of different apps available, again, from the web, from your mobile device. So pretty much wherever you are, you can have access to all of your project management stuff. You can check off things as you're going. And um, as we saw, you can go anywhere from very simple project tracking to much more complex ones, as that previous example showed us, where we had multiple team collaborators assigning different people of pieces of the project, that kind of thing. Due dates, calendar support is a big one as well. If you add due dates to things, there is an, a calendar built into Trello, but you can also export the calendar to be able to use those calendar events, those due dates on your mobile device or say in Outlook uh, here at NIU, keep track of things from pretty much any calendar app that you have. It is very, very useful. I've used this for my own um, personal research before, uh, especially when I did some uh, editing for a journal. Just keep track of all the different papers that were coming in and what stage of the progress uh, they were at. But I do highly recommend it, um, looking into it and recommending it to your students as well, because it may help them keep um, on top of different pieces that they have for their own group work. It's very easy to get up and running with, add people to, all you need is an email to add someone else to it and share things with. And then you can um, easily assign different tasks to people and stay on top of all your different uh, pieces. And that's available at Trello.com. 
and the uh, mobile apps are available in the different app stores just by searching Trello. Any questions about that? All right, if no questions, hopefully everyone feels uh, interested and thinks it's useful. An alternative um, to different kind of group uh, collaboration here is Rabbit, R-A-B-B dot I-T on the web. If anyone's familiar with Skype, this is a lot like Skype. Uh, unlike Skype, however, it's based around sharing um, different media on the web or just whole websites. Uh, very useful if you've ever had a group project where you want to do some kind of brainstorm. Uh, here I've booted up a YouTube video where I'm talking about flipped classroom. Me and my collaborators could be sharing this space and talking about different um, aspects or avenues for our research, uh, browsing the web together, talking about how we may want to uh, design our class, anything like that. So like uh, Skype for Business that we have access to at NIU, you could use Rabbit just to kind of collaborate using video chat features. But it's also very useful to keep everyone on the same page. So here, much like with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, where I'm sharing my PowerPoint slides, we're all in this same space and we're able to share um, different resources that we're finding out on the web. So you can use video, audio, text chat, just as we're doing here today and then share any kind of web content that you might find. I've used this one for um, watch parties, uh, for things like the presidential debates, get a few of my colleagues together and um, analyze things as they're happening in real time. That's uh, very handy because it does stream the same video content to everyone at the exact same time. Unlike Blackboard Collaborate where you can't always watch stuff um, in the moment together, uh, Rabbit will do that perfectly. Up to 15 people on video at a time, so it is smaller classes that this would be useful for, or again, kind of group collaboration or collaboration with a partner. Um, but sharing these kinds of things, easy to get up and running. You don't have to have a Skype account, or you don't have to be affiliated with NIU if you were thinking about using Skype for business. Alternatives to this, people may be familiar with Google Hangouts, and of course, as we're using today, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. And that's available, again, at rabbit, R-A-B-B dot I-T, out on the web. Last but not least, we want to talk about a few um, collaborative technologies. Uh, one of them is Telegram. So everyone has access to text messaging these days, but sometimes people don't want to share their uh, phone numbers with everyone else in the class. Uh, but you still want to be able to talk with everyone in real time, a good app that we've used for a number of years is Telegram. It's just a simple text communication um, piece of software. You can have group chats. So here we can see this is the Death Star 3.0 group chat. And apparently they're discussing um, building of the Death Star in this particular instance. But I can also have a private chat with anyone else on the service if I know their phone number um, or their email address or however they want to connect with me. Um, very easy, simple, intuitive, and you can also share pictures, video, or even files with people. So this is a good alternative for students who are looking at being able to collaborate with one another, may not be comfortable with sharing uh, phone numbers with everyone else, but do want to be able to um, have real-time communications and very securely. Telegram has some of the best security for any of these kind of texting apps out there. Again, very good for group collaboration. It is anywhere, anytime, so if you're thinking about using it for your own class, I would definitely recommend setting a some kind of policy around it. There are features to uh, tell it not to communicate with you after a certain time of the day or before a certain time of the day, too, which is very handy. It's kind of like a do not disturb mode if you're thinking about using it for yourself. Other alternatives I know um, become very popular recently here on campus among students is group.me. But a classic one would be WhatsApp. Um, if you're looking for something more full-featured for team communication, Slack is available. That's also free. Um, and there it has a lot of plugins for different services like Trello if you're looking at being able to not only talk with people but create and assign tasks within a communication app as well, which can be very interesting and handy. Or, of course, Skype for Business here on campus.
That's available at telegram.org from the web or telegram in any app store. Remind.com is another really good one. Yes, it used to be known as Remind 101. It's an excellent idea if you're looking at uh, getting people together in the same space or just for like mass communications with your students. Um, and again, it's somewhat private in that you don't have to give them your uh, phone number. Excellent choice. Okay. Uh, if people are looking at doing polling from within their class, one option you may want to look into is Poll Everywhere. It does really, really simple polling, only up to about 40 people or so. But if you have a large class, maybe you just want to, say, take the temperature of the room or get an idea about what your students are understanding or misunderstanding within that. Super easy. Um, you just create your polls, and then you give your respondents the URL to go to, or they can even text their um, answers into the service. So if people have an old feature phone, they can still uh, communicate with the class. Very nice way of just, again, kind of taking a read on your class, keeping people engaged, that kind of thing. So here's just one very simple poll where I asked, how are you feeling about the basics? Anywhere from I'm confused to hurry up to the hard stuff. And uh, most people had texted in or chosen um, option D here, loud and clear, so they got it. But there are some people who are lagging behind, about 20% of the class, so I may want to slow down a little bit to allow them to catch up a little bit more. It allows you to create simple polls on the fly in your class. You don't have to pre-create them in your PowerPoint slides, for instance, so it's very useful. And students get to respond from, as, from anywhere as long as they have either an internet or a phone connection. Again, it is available only up to 40 people, so if you do want more than that to respond, you'll have to pay for the service, but uh, as long as you're just looking for this kind of quick comprehension check from your class or just to keep your students' attention, um, this is an excellent way of just pulling your class very quickly and simply. That's available at polleverywhere.com, and there are those mobile apps available in the App Store. A little bit uh, more complex of a polling app, round out today's um, list of apps, is TriCider. This is a really fascinating poll app. You don't just ask a question. You ask a question and you allow your students to respond with answers they think may be correct or um, reflect on the question and ultimately vote on which one they think is the top answer. They can, if they want, even post their own um, discussions and argue about which answers are the best. So here they're listing pros, pros or cons, what they think are the pros and cons for each of the different answers for the question you pose. And then they can begin discussing them within themselves, kind of like the threaded discussion boards within Blackboard. So this is an excellent tool. You might consider this as an alternative if you're looking for some kind of um, reflective, discursive activity, and you ultimately want your class to come to some kind of consensus. Or maybe use this as a jumping off point for reflective papers later on. Uh, it's a really neat little web app here. You could, too, if you wanted as well, um, pose some kind of open-ended question and list responses that you anticipate your students may have and then let them discuss it. So it's very useful in a number of different ways. So again, you, you pose your question, you collect ideas, your students add their arguments and discuss amongst themselves and ultimately vote on which they think is the um, most logical, best, correct answer, anything like that. Um, incredibly interesting as an app. I have not used this one yet, but we came across it and we thought that this could be um, very, very powerful in classes for different kinds of activities. You can use it for simple polling, of course, or if you want, um, recommend it to your students. If they're looking for some way of like resolving disputes or doing some kind of group analysis on some topic, and there is a feature to uh, time the discussion as well. So if you want to stop it on a specific day and time, maybe you have your students uh, read the material on Monday and Tuesday, reflect and um, debate amongst themselves on Wednesday and Thursday, 
and stop it Thursday evening and then come back as a class to have some kind of debate on Friday. You could go through this activity and have some kind of um, discussion online where you might um, otherwise have it in class if you're transitioning from a face-to-face -to, -face to online class. And that's just available at tricider.com. All right. So I know we are at our time right now, but I was curious, um, from today's, what have you seen? What have your favorites been? Do you think you'll use any of these? Website for Poll Everywhere, someone asks. That is just polleverywhere.com. Or at least I hope it is. I'll verify this just to make sure. Yes, good, excellent. Yeah, so what are everyone else's favorites? Everyone should have microphone ask uh, access if you want to sign in. Cynthia says, Office Mix. Ah, interesting. Yeah, and we'd be happy to follow up if um, you have any questions on that. I think we may be giving a workshop on that later. Bill says, Rabbit sounds useful. So he likes Office Mix too. Excellent. And Jackie, you're very welcome for sharing software. Yes, um, we love pulling the open internet and seeing what's out there and trying to figure out what may be useful for people here on campus. All right, any last questions about anything I introduced today? Otherwise, thank you again for joining us. Um, always feel free to follow up with us on any of these tools here. Again, we can't be full tech support for all of them, for all the little questions, but we'd happy, be happy to uh, play around with, with them with you and um, answer kind of the basics and get a little bit more feel or intuitiveness with them. And uh, hope to see you next time. We have a number of different workshops coming up. You can always check for new ones at factdev.nau.edu slash fsprograms. Uh, we will be talking about breakout rooms in Blackboard Collaborate tomorrow. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, play in classrooms the following day. And uh, next week, we'll be uh, having a much more deep dive into Zotero's reference management. Um, so if you're interested in that, haven't yet seen it, and like a little tutorial, feel free to come to that. Otherwise, we will be sending out a uh, survey for everyone. So please let us know what you thought of today's workshop. That always helps us figure out what to offer in the future.